Oh, wow. It's so lovely seeing all of the numbers just going up and up and up. Um, welcome, everybody that has signed on. It's so lovely to see you all. And I am I'm called Summer. I represent the Feminist Library in London. So we, for anyone that doesn't know, we're based in Peckham in London. Um, we are a reference only library. We were formed in 1975 by a group of women. And we've got all sorts of material if you're into feminism, which of course you are, you're here. We've got a massive collection of zines. We've got journals from all over the world. We've got a fiction room. We've got a lot of nonfiction. Um, we've got a very comfy couch and I do a cracking cup of tea. I'll be there on Wednesdays and Fridays and we're also open on Saturdays. So pop along if you're around the area, it would be lovely to see any of you. I'm so excited to be here at the launch of your book, Joe. Left Feminism, which brings together a decade of interviews with key feminist academics through sensitive and nuanced conversations. Joe brings to life actions, arguments and solutions generated by diverse feminist thinkers on the left. Um, this book, if you're interested in purchasing it, it's available at the Lawrence Wishart website, which is www.lwbooks.co.uk. I'll also let you know we've got a little code for 10% discount, which is Left Feminism, all in caps. And I am going to introduce the speakers. So today we've got Joe Littler, which is a professor of social analysis and cultural politics at City University of London and a member of the surrounding editorial collective. We have Nancy Fraser, who is the Henry and Louise A. Lueb Professor of Philosophy and Politics at the New School for Social Research. We've got Veronica Gago is a leader in Argentina's hashtag Ni Una Menos movement as both a theoretician and an activist. She is also a professor of social sciences at the University of Buenos Aires, professor at the Instituto de Alto Studios, Universidad Nacional de San Martin, and assistant researcher at the National Scientific and Technical Research Council. And we've also got Sophie Siddique, who is deputy editor of Race and Class. She is researching and writing on anti-racist feminism in the UK. I'll just let you know, guys, if you've got any questions for the panel, please leave them for the Q&A at the end of the session and any other queries, such as tech related questions or questions for the publisher, just pop them in the chat and one of us will get back to you about it. And with that, I shall pass it on to you, Joe. and I'm so excited to be part of this. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Summer, for introducing. Uh, thanks to the Feminist Library and Lawrence Wishart for co-hosting, uh, to all my generous and brilliant interviewees, and to everyone here at this event to mark the publication of Left Feminisms. So online events do feel very 2021, um, but they also enable us to connect across continents and so I'm very glad we can do that with our wonderful speakers today. So I'm going to introduce the book a little to begin with, and then Nancy, Veronica and Sophia will join in and talk too. And then after that, we'll have a bigger discussion. So over the past decade or so, I've been interviewing feminist academics on different parts of the left from different generations who are all involved with political, creative or artistic projects, activist projects outside as well as inside universities. So 14 of those interviews are collected together in this book. And this means that I'm not really the book's author, I'm more the organizer and editor. I started doing these interviews for Soundings, a journal which aims to act as a bridge between academic and public discussion and to interrogate the political and cultural dynamics of the present, or what cultural studies loves to call the contemporary conjuncture. And this meant that I could translate feminist ideas for a broader audience, as well as try and figure out the context in which they were generated. The Italian theorist Antonio Gramsci once suggested there were two kinds of intellectuals, traditional intellectuals who produce abstract theory in universities, and organic intellectuals, people whose ideas come from their own social context, which they use to shape political movements. And in this project, I've approached my interviewees in both senses, 
attempting to better understand feminist theories to, to figure out where they come from and how they swim in and shape the world. And doing this also let me be very nosy because I've always been a bit of a very frustrated journalist. So, you know, it would let me humanize abstract figures and find out more about people too. So it's a collection of conversations with different feminists on the left. And I use the term left feminisms deliberately. I use it in part to point to its difference from right wing or neoliberal feminism, which has soared into the ascendancy over the past four decades. This tells us we just have to lean in to pull ourselves up the ladder whilst elbowing others out of the way and trampling on them in the process. And I use the term because even whilst it can be fractious and divided, as Finn Mackay says in this book, there are many feminist fault lines. Over the past decade, left feminism has really become reinvigorated. It's been given a new incarnation and lease of life. As we can see, for example, in the grassroots actions against violence against women and financialized debt, you know, in, as Neo Nemenos, or the gendered effects of austerity politics on domestic violence services, as with Sisters Uncut. We can see it in the renewed anger at gendered pay gaps and the ballooning costs of childcare. We can see it in the surge of women becoming involved in strikes and the revitalization of the women's strike and the trade union movement, as well as a new wave of popular feminists in municipal and parliamentary politics. So this is all part of a backlash against the savage effects of the enormous transfer of wealth to the super rich, which has happened over the past few decades, and which has deepened gender inequalities in the intersection of class, ethnicity and disability, to name but a few. I also use the term left as my daughter left feminisms because at a time when we have a surge in right wing populisms, increasing xenophobia, soaring power of hedge funds and attempts to roll back feminist gains, including reproductive and LGBTQ plus rights. It's necessary to unite across our differences is if we are to move, as the title of one well known put it back in 1979 beyond the fragments. As our, as our Kugo Emajulu says in the book, we need people in lots of different kinds of spaces and places in order to take back power. So this book features a wide range of perspectives from social democrats to socialists to communists who don't all disagree or agree, but they do have <coughs> recurring interests in sharing the wealth, in prefigurative forms of politics, in intersectionality, and in the insistence that we are relational beings that it's not possible to live in isolation. Because contemporary market-oriented societies relentlessly incite us to think of ourselves as atomized individuals who should primarily compete rather than cooperate with each other. And left feminism works against such lonely and divisive ways of being. As Sheila Robotham says, people are more than one category of oppression and we all develop our ideas and attitudes in relation to others. So these are conversations critical dialogues and edited oral history interviews. In this, they, it joins other collections that I really like, including Once a Feminist, the Virago book from three decades ago, and the more recent book, Revolutionary Feminisms. And I hope they provide a resource for understanding different strands of the past, whether second wave feminist consciousness raising groups, anti-racist feminist strikes, or accounts of lived experience, like Carol Tullock's brilliant descriptions of growing up working class in Doncaster in the north of England and the clothes she wore, as well as the problems, potentials, and possibilities of the present. So I think it's the kind of book that you can dip into or read the whole way through. It's necessarily incomplete, but I hope it's interesting and entertaining, and I hope it can help start further conversations. So in this vein, I've asked Nancy, Veronica and Sophia to think about a question. Uh, the question is, what issues are particularly important for left feminism right now? And what conversations should we be having? So I'll pass over to you, Nancy, first. 
Thanks, Joe. And, and thanks to the publisher and uh, all the organizers of the event, the library and so on. I'm very happy to participate. It's a great, great book. And uh, Joe, it was a real inspiration to think about having done all these great interviews that you did over the years to put them together and make them more widely available. Um, so you ask, um, what issues should left-wing feminists be especially concerned about? And um, on that, I I think I want to say you you named them uh, just now in your introductory remarks, right? Reproductive justice, debt, uh, the crisis of child care, femicide, uh, et cetera, et cetera. In effect, these are the issues that all feminists care about. I don't think that left feminism is distinguished by focusing on different issues. I think the, the harder question is how we focus on them and how we connect them, uh, not only to each other and to a range of other very bad things that are happening in the world uh, to everybody, um, but also how we connect them to what I think of as the, the single underlying social system that generates all of them, which of course is a capitalist society. Um, so all, all my thoughts about conversations, who we should be talking to and about what, lead back to that fundamental um, idea. Um, so I think a, a number of conversations that we want to have are conversations within feminism. I think we want to try to convince feminists who don't now think of themselves as left feminists to become such. And um, that means um, really um, trying to, to push the alternative. Do you want a society in, in which women have a kind of parity with men, which really would mean men basically of their own class or racial ethnic group. Do we want parity within an existing inegalitarian and exploitative and oppressive society? Or does the liberation of women require overturning that society and replacing it with a new one? That's really fundamental. And it sounds like a, a very abstract question. Uh, and so right away, we want to ask, what does it mean in practice to right, choose one side or the other, to choose the transformative side versus what we might call the ameliorative side, the, the impro improving things within the existing system side? And um, I think it, 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 it must make a difference how we approach femicide, how we approach the crisis of childcare, the crisis of livelihood, the uh, crisis of violence against women and, and against uh, uh, non-binary and trans people and so on. Um, and I've always been impressed with, um, with this idea of Andre Gortz, non-reformist reform. Um, their feminists need to fight against the horrific things that are going on in the here and now. But we also, if we are left feminists, need to do that in such a way that we are not just, you know, winning stop gaps that demobilize people and send them back to the same old, same old. What we want is to conduct those struggles and, and win whatever victories we can in such a way that opens up the terrain for deeper, more radical claims and transformations. So I think with respect to the, the issues, um, there's this kind of a conversation. However, um, I think there's a whole nother set of conversations that we need to have in addition. And, and those have to do with other corners, let's say, of the anti-capitalist left for whom questions of gender and sexuality are not front and center, but who are nevertheless 
in some sense, our very important potential allies. And I'm thinking about uh, radical ecological movements. I'm thinking about anti-racist and anti-imperialist movements, about the uh, reviving labor movements that, uh, at least in some places, are um, giving me a little bit of hope in an otherwise bleak uh, time. Um, the, uh, many of these, um, these corners of the left um, don't yet take gender questions as seriously as they should, don't yet understand fully that gender asymmetry is not a contingent aspect of capitalist society, but a deeply implanted structural feature of it, which has to do with the way the society separates production from reproduction in an institutional way. Um, so we need to have conversations with these allies that um, uh, bring us more close together. And that will also mean, I think, learning from them to the extent that some of us may not already um, be uh, fully up to speed on, on the way in which ecological destruction is also a deep structural feature of capitalist society, not an accident, et cetera, et cetera. Same with race, in my view. So a lot of the, uh, these conversations have to do with getting an, a, a, a more fully adequate view of what the enemy is in the sense of what the society is like, and therefore a clearer view of who our allies are and why this, why left feminism has to be part of a broader left-wing anti-capitalist movement, assuming that we can convince the other parts of that movement to take us more seriously than they uh, so far have. Um, and then there's finally, and this is the hardest part of all, the conversation with uh, you know, the sort of um, broader world. Um, I, I'm more struck now, uh, if a few years ago, I thought that we could see a, um, a flowering of a kind of left populism as an alternative, both to the progressive neoliberalism that uh, Joe described with crack the glass ceiling, lean in and so on, on the one side and to right-wing populism on the other. And I thought that that, uh, that left-wing populist uh, alternative would be the fertile ground for us for uh, to fight our battles and to see things uh, develop in a, a way that would uh, forward our aims more. Now, Latin America aside, and I'll be really interested to hear uh, what uh, Veronica says about that. Um, in, the, in, 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 in Europe and North America, I, I have to say that for now, right-wing populism is, has certainly eclipsed the left populist alternative. And so the, um, the alternative is, is worse. We are facing now just that old um, progressive neoliberalism versus um, right-wing populism. Naturally, feminists in these contexts are under tremendous pressure, both externally and internally, to block with the liberals, and you know, try to defend whatever paltry, you know, reproductive rights and so on that we had now under assault from the right. That's completely understandable. I still think that's not what a an empowered left feminism should be doing. I think we should be staking out an offensive position that is much more radical and egalitarian. I think those liberals are not our true friends, actually. Um, but it is much harder, I have to confess, to um, see, find the traction uh, 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 today, uh, absent in, in what, what I would call in the United States, the Sanders factor, absent that. Right. Yeah. Anyway, uh, I'll, let me stop there. Uh, I, it, it, what I'm trying to suggest is there are a lot of, of difficult uh difficult things that we have to think about and figure out 
what to do about. And conversations like this are a, uh, a something I feel a great need for in order to get uh, more clarity and, and uh, be involved in, in, uh, in discussions about this. So again, thank you, Joe, for organizing it. Thank you. Yeah, it's not a small subject, is it? And that's given us a lot to think about. Um, if people want to write anything in the Q&A uh, questions, then hopefully we'll have time to pick up a couple near the end. Um, but I will now turn over to Veronica to answer, challenge, extend the question. Thank you. Well, first of all, thank you, Joe, for inviting me to be part of, of this book. And thanks also for gathering together. I think that is a central function of authorship, and especially feminist authorship, this exercise of gathering different generations, experiences, and, and voices. So thanks. I think this uh, fantastic book of conversations that brings together multiple experiences and voices, and therefore is uh, a key uh, experience of collective thought, how we all the time are trying to put together different trajectories and different experiences. And also, I think that the interest produced by these books and these presentations uh, is a sort of indication of the vitality of this collective thought. And also this, as Nancy was saying, this uh, necessity for uh, discussion and, uh, well, this moment of collective meeting. So about the, uh, the, the difficult questions that you propose or suggest to us, I think that the, the first challenge is a search of urgencies related to what is understood as social reproduction. Food, housing, health, education, land ownership, and of course, incomes and debt. And I'm thinking in incomes, of course, of wages, subsidies, and, and pensions. I think this is the agenda that became visible with the pandemic and today is expressed in a series of struggles, strikes, and protest actions. In several places, uh, we see that the struggle for housing, for example, for rent regulation against evictions have been systematized as a common issue, as a transversal issue, for example. And the interesting thing, as is happening with many other protests and many other issues at the moment, uh, is that they take on a feminist character in their approaches, in their language, and in their political articulations. And I think that this is very interesting, how different issues of what we call social reproduction, but with other political languages, uh, we can talk about public uh, resources or, uh, well, different aspects of everyday life are today um, embedded in a sort of feminist uh, agenda, in a feminist uh, vocabulary, and especially they are developed with a feminist articulation of political collectives and different groups of interest and also uh, different dynamics of uh, protest. So um, I think that this point of political articulation that the feminist movement is trying to develop nowadays is one of the key points of our, uh, I think, conversation or this ongoing conversation. And completely related with that are the, at least in Latin America, the anti-extractivist struggles and the ecological conflicts that emerge from the territories devastated by the plundering of extractive capitalism. I think also that thanks to feminist struggle, they have been taken on a more radical character. They have built a greater capacity for dissemination precisely because feminism have made an enormous popular pedagogy on the meaning of sovereignty over bodies and territories. I think that this connection between popular ecology, feminism, and anti-extractivist struggles is very important in order to weave together these struggles. But also, we can understand how nowadays 
the ecological struggle is more powerful because it uh, takes into account the feminist agenda and the feminist language and also the feminist uh, political articulations to express, for example, this connection between body and territory. Uh, I, and I think that this is a very key aspect of uh, anti-capitalist feminism. And um, also, I think that this allows different feminism. We talk here of popular feminism, indigenous feminism, Afro-feminism, slum feminism. So this heterogeneity, I think, is a practical exercise of political articulation. And I think that is interesting, uh, it's interesting sorry, uh, when we think in these dynamics together and not as a set of, as a set of uh, differences that are negotiating, negotiating, uh, negotiating sorry, power. Um, and, uh, and I also think that this political articulation is what allows feminism to proliferate in spaces and spheres in which they did not have such a presence before. We can see nowadays uh, feminist presence in very different domains and struggles and conflicts. And I think this is a, a sort of political growth of the feminist movement that is present in very different uh, movements. And, and of course, a sort of growth of feminism in different political organizations, in different popular spaces. So feminism is not something that came from outside. It's something that uh, grows from within. And I think this is a very interesting uh, difference in the, in the last years, how this proliferation uh, of feminism, of popular feminism, is a way of reorganizing uh, pre-existing political uh, movement and pre-existing uh, popular organizations. Feminism is a sort of also a vector of radicalization of pre-existing political organizations. And this process, I think, is very interesting. And of course, there is one of the reasons of, of that uh, is the, the capacity that feminism um, has to politicize the spheres of reproduction of love in such a way that it becomes unavoidable in these claims, in different conflicts. And I think this is very interesting. How we can sustain this un unavoidable presence of feminism in different conflicts. Uh, then I would like to, to, to underline the importance of building strategies because we share a lot of diagnosis, we produce uh, moments of collective analysis, and uh, I think this is very interesting, this uh, uh, capacity for uh, theorizing, for uh, conceptualize all the time what we are doing, how we are uh, organizing collective uh, uh, debates and how we are also impacting the common sense and so on. But I think that the, the, the other uh, key question is uh, the importance of building strategies. How do confront this plunder, these new forms, I, I call financial exploitation to talk about debt, for example, uh, and how we confront concretely the precarization of our means of reproduction. I think this is a very important question. How we can organize our struggles in terms of confronting the uh, precarization and the appropriation of our means of reproduction. I think that the anti-structivist struggles has a lot to do with that. And this connection between anti-structivism and means of reproduction of everyday life is very important. Um, and, and here I want to emphasize also a, a problem of time. Today, I think, and we are experiencing uh, the, the increasingly difficult uh, experience to have time to dedicate to political organization. 
and to be available, for example, for articulations that requires a lot of work and um, also all the political uh, energy that means uh, meetings and designing a flyer and organizing a meal and uh, well, a lot of different things that we do that implies political work. So I think that is because working hours have intensified and expanded both in person and virtually. So this issue of, uh, we can call it the, the war on the length of the working day, there is a, a traditional issue for, for, well, the left, but today we have to, to confront that in very different coordinates and in wageless conditions for the great majority. But I think that we have to politicize this issue of time because it's the concrete condition for the political organization. So I think this is for me something very important. I like very much how Silvia Federici in a recent um, text translate that into a question and I am quoting her. Uh, she says, how much can we shift our reproductive activity from the reproduction of labor power to the reproduction of our power to struggle. And I think this is a powerful thought because it's a powerful shift and a powerful way of looking at reproduction as a political concept and how we can make sustainable our conditions of struggles that is not easy. So, what are the conditions to make our power struggle sustainable, to produce duration, lasting conditions in a political process? I think this is also an issue that we have to take into account. And this is the, my final point. Uh, I think this involves, of course, uh, a never ending work of political alliances, strategies and alliances. Um, we here in, in Argentina with different collectives and cameras, we are working in the idea of the feminist unionism as a way to connect this question of the work that we are developing with the feminist strike, but also this issue of social reproduction. So we are um, trying to think in certain type of alliances um, that has allowed uh, us uh, for broadening the strike by weaving alliances between feminism and unionism, but also to think broader or to expand the concept as a feminist unionism. And I think that feminist unionism exceeds the unions, is something uh, bigger. And at the same time, it is uh, a way of recreate the political experience of uh, unionism. And it is a very concrete way of organizing demands and claims that takes very seriously how feminism has broadened the concept of work and focusing in social reproduction. So I think that these are the points that I would like to, to share for our conversation. Thank you. That's wonderful. Thank you. Continue to learn from all of you so much. Um, and it's, yeah, I'm noticing lots of resonant themes um, about strategies, about alliances, about expanded notion of reproduction. So next over to Sophia. Thank you. Hi, everyone. It's such an honor to be here and to follow like two incredible activists and writers. Um, and thank you, Joe, for putting together this incredible book. I've been reading it over the weekend, and honestly, it's been such a joy to read and think about all the different echoes and resonances from one chapter to the next um, and the sort of collectivity that it produces. So thank you, Joe. Um, so I'm so excited that this is a transnational conversation um, because, yeah, now more than ever, I think we have so much to learn and share from each other. And I'm going to speak directly to my locality, which is the UK um, and the issues that we're facing here, but also how we need to connect on a global level as well. Um, so the first point I wanted to make was about the threat of the far right. 
um, and particularly their weaponizing of gender-based violence, which I think is a really key issue for left feminists today. Broadly speaking, as Nancy mentioned, the far right are mobilizing globally through attacks on reproductive rights, LGBTQ rights, on migrant and refugee communities, but I want to flag a very specific way they're mobilizing in the UK and across Europe at the moment, which is through the weaponization of sexual violence for a racist and anti-immigrant agenda. We're seeing a recurrent problem of far-right groups claiming to be protectors of women and children by weaponizing in incidents of sexual violence and using it to claim that all black and brown men are a threat to white women and by extension the nation. And this very emotive rhetoric is designed to create fear and to scapegoat refugees for economic problems and play on racist and Islamophobic tropes. And it was really interesting to read the book and see um, Ron Ware's work on the same subjects. And this has been a driving force of far right anti-immigration protests outside asylum seeking uh, asylum housing in recent months here in the UK and in Ireland. And they're basically able to tap into fears around the housing crisis and also the economic crisis and seize the opportunity to blame uh, vulnerable minorities. And such protests have had really violent consequences for refugees and migrant communities, including women who are being terrorized and attacked. And it's becoming more clear that far, far right violence is being used by governments to implement further programs of detention, deportation and the curtailing of human rights. And we as feminists know and have long been shouting that the majority of gender-based violence is committed by people known to the victims. Gender-based violence is not something that's imported from abroad and it's got nothing to do with race, nationality or citizenship status. It's systemic across all communities. But I feel that we as left anti-racist feminists need to be louder in taking on the far right, their racism, their misogyny and their transphobia and raise consciousness about the root causes of gender-based violence to ensure that the issue can't be co-opted by the far right, who at the moment are very easily filling in the vacuum with their very emotive and hate hateful rhetoric, whilst instrumentalizing the feminist cause as well. But I also want to say that feminists on the ground are already having these conversations, and I've been speaking to socialist feminists in Ireland who organize under the banner Rosa, and they're doing everything they can to combat this issue, leafleting, protesting, providing political education and running conferences on this issue. And actually a couple of weeks ago, 50,000 people in Ireland, feminists, anti-racists, LGBTQ activists, trade unionists and ordinary people took to the streets to protest against the racism of the far right with more protests planned in the coming days. And I think this kind of intersectional solidarity in practice completely demolishes the claim that the far right represent the working class and we need to complete, continue to build on this kind of resistance. So I think this links to the kind of the unity and the links we need to forge between struggles. Um, and then very much linked to the issue, um, the second point I wanted to make was about the need for left feminists to confront head on the demonization of trans people. Feminism is at its most powerful when it's radically inclusive and finds ways to articulate how our struggles interrelate. It's in a context of neoliberalism that difference is being weaponized against us, falsely positioning marginalized groups in competition with each other rather than in solidarity, which ultimately works to fragment our struggles and break down unity. We need to urgently overcome this and show that trans rights and the rights of LGBTQ communities have always been and always will be central to feminism. And Finn's chapter articulates this really well in the book. And I think this is so important right now when trans communities are increasingly under attack with an acceleration of anti-LGBTQ rhetoric over the past year, the far right targeting of drag queen story hours, which you've seen is part of a global campaign. And also in this very increasingly hostile environment upheld by the media and our, by our governments, a 16 year old trans girl, Brianna Gay was killed last month in Cheshire after facing years of transphobic harassment. So it's in this really urgent context that I think we need more conversations about how trans and women's liberation are interlocking struggles and more action is needed that stands united against all forms of essentialism. 
which takes me to my final point, which is a broader point, um, which both Nancy and Veronica have made, which is about connecting the dots between our struggles. So I think now more than ever, it's really important that we don't operate in silos, but we see connections between different issues in order to fight violence in all its forms. Racism, patriarchy, ableism, homophobia, and transphobia are all interlinked, and no form of subordination st ever stands alone. And what links these systems of oppression is a desire to control, regulate, and constrain human life, which is central to the functioning of global capitalism. And understanding these connections must be the basis of our solidarity on a global level. And for me, this also means reckoning with police violence and militarization, the violence of borders, the violence of austerity, the epidemic of gender-based violence, and also the violence of imperialism that often goes hand in hand with the destruction of our environment. And this also requires a recognition that we can't rely on carceral solutions, such as prisons, punishment logics, and exclusion that never get to the root cause of systemic issues. Interpersonal violence is on a continuum with state violence. And here, I think we can learn a lot from the abolitionist movements that work to undo violence at its root, which ultimately requires a rethinking, a restructuring, and ultimately, as Nancy also mentioned, a transformation of society. So I just wanna end on this final point that we need to be brave enough to imagine visions for what the world could be and to actively build alternatives to create the world that we want. How are we gonna get there? How are we gonna build futures grounded, not in violence, but in the flourishing of life. Thanks. That's brilliant. Thank you, Sophia. Thank you for connecting the dots. Um, so before I turn to a question, uh, does anyone, any any speaker want to respond to any other speakers' points? No? Okay. Um, so we let's go and have a look at some of the questions that have come in um how can we as left feminists change the narrative where left feminism is seen as too radical and involving women who hate men anyone want to have a go at that one um i could start it off sure. um yeah, I think for me, um, especially this thing that, oh, feminism, this preconception that feminism is women who hate men, like, that's just never been true. And for me, I always go back to black feminism, which has really shaped my thinking and my understanding, particularly British black feminism, that always saw that feminism isn't solely about the rights of women, but it's about the rights of a community as a whole. And it's always been a key movement that fights against, for instance, police violence, or immigration regimes. Um, so I think going back to history and actually showing examples of that can always be a good and powerful way forward. Uh, I, I'll add um, one thought. Um, I mean, that I, I think what, what uh, Sophia just said is, is to the point. I have to say that from where I sit, um, I don't see a lot of this kind of uh, talk about feminism anymore. I, I remember it from <laughs> when I was young, but I don't hear a lot of it now. And I think, and maybe this is more specific to the United States, I don't know. I think that feminism is almost the common sense now of the United States. I don't think it's something that's it's demonized. Uh, critical race theory is being demonized. Trans people are being demonized. But feminism, um, not exactly. And so I think we have a different kind of a problem, which is um, this common sense feminism is actually not necessarily very helpful. Uh, we have Fox News is, you know, feminist, uh, right? It, it are, feminism, the way it exists now, articulates with so many different political stances that it it threatens to sort of get lost. And that's why uh, I started out by saying that um, uh, I, I want to kind of push the issue within this feminist common sense about which feminism and why. That's not a direct answer to the question, I realize. Um, maybe it's just a, a way of resituating the problem, at least as I 
feel I face it. Thank you. Veronica? I think, yes, I think this debate is very interesting. In what sense we can see that feminism became the common sense as a victory at the same time and at a problem. And uh, how we can connect this common sense with radical issues. And I think all the time we are uh, being challenged about how to do this, for example. And uh, from the point of view of the media, for example, they uh, are very feminist if the position of the feminist uh, are the victim position. But if you are reclaiming land from the indigenous community, or if you are reclaiming uh, union rights, where well, you are not just a feminist, a good feminist. So I think that this sort of uh, everyday and political uh, work with this common sense of feminism, it is very interesting also to expand all the time what are the issues of feminism, because I think that this is also a situation because, because of feminism nowadays is like a transversal uh, debate. So feminism is like everywhere. And it is a sort of vector, I, I will say not radicalization, but also as a vector of problematization of what does it mean feminism in that situation or, or related to that issue or in terms of, uh, for example, um, political uh, commitment. So I, I think that this is very interesting how to, to, to navigate this idea of feminism as a common sense between this sort of banality no, of, the, of the world and at the same time, the capacity, the political capacity to link feminism with these radical issues and uh, radical contents. That's great, thank you. Unsurprisingly, I agree with you all. Um, I, I guess I, I would just add, um, I, it's, I think it's important to draw on those traditions that emphasize what masculinity and men can gain through feminism. So for example, greater forms of emotional articulacy and better rates of mental health um, and the ability to you know, in, involve be involved in a variety of forms of social reproduction and you know, by shaking up the divisions between the private and public sphere. So, you know, that's why the, the four day week is a feminist issue, isn't it? Because it helps helps provide different ways and more, more ways for people to care. Um, Okay, so I'm just working down through the questions. Um, another one is, how should left feminists respond to the backlash against what is disparaged as identity politics and wokeness? Anyone want to answer that? Well, um, I mean, again, I guess I want to be slightly uh, contrarian. I mean, of course, there's the, the right wing weaponization of wokeness um, and um, in all of its um, manifestations, the sort of, um, you know, putting a huge media spotlight on, um, you know, some allegedly, you know, horrific uh, cancellation of somebody or another for an apparently innocent right remark. Um, now it's migrating into trying to control what's taught in the schools. The schools are teaching woke. It's not just individual behavior, but it's institutionalized. Um, so all of that just has to be demystified. Um, uh, and again, I think in the US, um, the question of, of how to teach about the history of the country with respect to race and slavery is the sort of front line, uh, less, more, more than, than gender. That, that's sort of where the battle is very, very drawn in terms of wo wokeness in the schools. Um, but I do want to say on the other side that we, I think we do have some kind of a problem. Maybe I sh we shouldn't use their word, the woke problem. Um, but 
there is a um, a long standing um, tendency on the left in general and within feminism as well to obsessively focus on interpersonal um, interactions, so-called microaggressions, um, bad behavior, bad language use, et cetera, et cetera. Those things are bad, believe me, uh, I'm against them, but there's a problem when a movement um, sort of loses the, the forest for the trees, so to speak. I mean, we need to be, I think, mainly focused on structural and institutional transformation. And the strategic problem is how to get, and, and here I agreed with something Veronica said earlier, is, is how you get from this campaign here and that campaign here, connecting the dots, as Sophia said, how you get from that to some kind of a movement that is broad enough or coalition of movements that is broad and strong enough to contemplate a transformation at the scale I'm interested in. The, the more energy we use on, the, um, on this kind of interpersonal level, the less we have for that other stuff. I'm not saying it's exactly a zero sum game, but I am troubled. And again, this may be more specific to the US. Um, I am troubled by a kind of moralization of feminist politics and of other uh, social movements that we might be allied with uh, in that. Um, so it's a, it's a mixed answer. <laughs> Mixed answer. Thank you. Yeah, I, guess I can add a little bit to that. I think, um, yeah, it's also a really big issue here where this term wokeness is kind of lumping together so many different things. We're seeing uh, the denial of institutional racism. Because um, I work at the Institute of Race Relations, where we're always putting a focus on structural racism. But what we're seeing that the government is doing is denial of the existence of institutional racism, which is taking us back decades. Um, but also linked to that and linked to this, um, this narrative of wokeness is um, attacks on drag queen story hours as well. And I think it all sort of falls under the same umbrella of these kind of culture wars that, as you said, are a distraction from actually what the main issues are. And they're just kind of a way of pitting people against each other, um, fueling anger on the ground. Um, and it often plays on a kind of victimhood as well of feeling like you've been left behind. Um, so I think, yeah, putting the structural front and center is always really important in terms of combating these kind of myths and this kind of rhetoric, which can actually lead to really violent consequences as well. Yeah, exactly. And that's a deliberate strategy, isn't it? You just have to see the, like in Britain, the leaked memos from the government you know, saying that they want to stir up a culture war. Um, I think it's also, it's, it's, we can reclaim wokeness by saying it's good to be awake. <laughs> um, and the, I think that issue of moralism is, is interesting, Nancy, and it's part of, I guess I see it as part of the, you know, the vestige of a kind of neoliberal moralization ethos which which is deeply competitive and it's is not about joining the dots is not about alliances and um one recent take that i've i thought was very useful on this was adrienne marie brown's work in her her book we will not cancel us um which you know pits that moralism against strategic alliances in a re in a really nice way that's you know bound up with transformative justice and working together. Veronica, did you want to say anything about that? Yes, I, I think this, this question is absolutely urgent about against moralization because it's, it's I think it's a counter revolutionary strategy to divide in different parts of the movement and to produce this moral judgment from one to others and to disconnect the economic issues and especially how we are working on the economic violence as a main uh, feminist issue and disconnect that from other struggles. So 
feminism is reduced to a cultural, symbolic, or interpersonal matter. So I think that all the displacements that we can do trying to reconnect, for example, with economic violence is a sort of uh, tactic to avoid this moralization. Absolutely. Um, I've just realized it is nearly half past. So as, as you said before, Veronica, time is time is being squeezed and that's a very key issue for the present. Mm -hmm. So um, I think we, we think we have to wrap up. I think Summer wanted to wrap up. Shall I pass over to you now, Summer? But th just to say first, thanks everyone for coming along and thanks to all these amazing speakers. And it's also really nice to see people here who I would also have liked to have interviewed. I you know, keep thinking I'd um, like to carry on interviewing and interviewing. Um, and I didn't even get to ask my question about who you would all interview. <laughs> If you could, but, um, any anyone want to throw a name out there? Maybe that's for later. Okay, Summer, over for you. Over to you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what a lovely, lovely, lovely event. Um, I particularly loved feminism. Feminism is at its most radical when it's at its most inclusive. That is so lovely, and it's directly in line with the ethos of the library. The feminist library is so grateful that we've been able to collaborate on this I really really enjoyed it I could have listened to it for hours and I just want to say thank you from me from all the library thank you thank you thank you I shall be purchasing the book and what a wonderful talk thank you for being such inspiring women and spreading the message thank you